Hello again. I'm Marie Swaru. Before anything else I want to thank you all for subscribing to my new YouTube channel, and also thank you so much for all your support. It motivates me a lot to be able to carry on with my work. You can take this as science fiction or however you like. And I'm sharing all this for entertainment purposes only. But we here take all this information very seriously and sharing it is very important for me and to us. Whoever has eyes to see. Please understand that I must say these words so YouTube doesn't misunderstand me. I know this stellar navigation subject has been published before by my predecessors. But these are my words, and today I'm only referring to the basic principles. Later on I will make more detailed videos about all the parts involved with it. I want you all to know that while I'm here, on board Starship Talika I'm proceeding with my education here, taking personalized, hands-on classes nearly every day with the members of her crew. I'm learning things from highly recognized members of this crew, like mathematics, engineering, and navigation with Zykura, how to cook nice food with Athena Swaru, martial arts with Aelia and Cassia, or history and politics, and a bit of everything else with Queen Alanim herself. I'm continuing with my education here. And part of my intention for creating this YouTube channel is to be able to share with you all what I've recently seen or what I'm seeing in my day-to-day -day studies and subjects here. As well as simply sharing my life here on board a Tejetan heavy cruiser. For Tejetan starships are not only means and machines for transportation, they are schools as well, as they have it as a norm that all the young ones, members of this civilization must have at their disposal all the knowledge of the whole culture. And they are taught just about everything but always respecting the interests, wants and needs of the student. With a more hands-on and practical approach to education, and not so much on a theoretical level only. Stellar Navigation, Basic Principles As I explained in the last video, Tejitans interpret the universe as a high-density, high-vibrating liquid-like media in which a set of intentional harmonics, using gravity pulses, cause the vibration to condense into standing waves that in turn form the particles that when combined will form all solid objects. I also explained how each little particle has a unique vibrational signature and identity throughout the entire universe. Using very powerful and advanced holistic computers, we can map those particles to a very exact degree, although mapping each individual one would be impossible, it is not necessary as average values can be given to large groups of them with enough exactitude because they are interconnected in a precise mathematical way, between them and also with everything else. So our computers can anticipate and predict the values some specific particles must have in any given area if the need should arise. When you have an extended map, made of particle mathematical values, and of any area, no matter how big or small, we call it a frequency map, and that is what starships use for navigation, leaving conventional Earth-like maps only for near and close-range navigation at slow speeds. What I mean by conventional Earth-like maps are those based on three-dimensional coordinates such as X, Y, and Z or like two-dimensional maps like one made of paper. The computer of a starship will hold all the necessary information for interstellar navigation in frequency map format only and that is more than enough to lead the ship anywhere although traditional maps are still being used, but are simply not practical when involving very large distances and speeds. When a ship is moving at slow speed, the crew uses traditional maps most of the time, and when the ship is traveling to a faraway destination, it mainly uses frequency maps, in this case only leaving traditional maps as a reference only, because beings like us all, all of you included, prefer to think in terms of here and there and of distance and not think in terms of mathematical relationships between frequencies. We could say that a starship's crew still uses traditional maps to conserve some of their mental sanity and life experience, because when traveling large distances a starship does not move at speed, at any speed what it really does is jump from the origin to the destiny. 
and not move from one to the other. The so-called hyperspeed or hyperspace travel mode works by knowing the exact frequency map of the destination also knowing the exact frequency map of the place of departure. As I explained before, each particle and therefore group of particles and place in space, big and small holds a unique frequency. The navigation computer will input the exact frequency of the map of the desired destination into the ship's engine, or engines, that in turn emulate such a frequency enveloping the entire ship in a high-energy toroidal cocoon. Using the dominant frequency principle, this high-energy cocoon the ship is in emulating the exact frequency of the destination, will change the vibration and mathematical co-relationship of all the structures of the ship and everything in it, to match the exact mathematical frequency relationship of the place of destination. Therefore the ship no longer vibrates accordingly to the place of departure and it does vibrate accordingly to the place of destination. Using the principle of non-locality, the ship will no longer exist in the location of departure and it will suddenly exist in the place of destination as it no longer is vibrationally compatible with the first as it is with the second. The principle of non-locality states that distances and speed are as illusory as is time being only part of the interpretation of someone having an experience in physicality and not an intrinsic property of the universe as a whole from the most expanded point of view. Time space, distances, and speed are only an illusion. No matter how compelling that illusion may be from the point of view of the person experiencing it all. This navigation jump makes people call ships capable of doing this, jump ships or beam ships. There are protocols to follow for ships so they can enter safely into one or another planetary system. For example they must exit from their jump far away enough from the planet of destination, having previously stated their place of arrival to the planet's space traffic controllers, very much like with an airport on Earth. If a ship is big and heavy it must exit from its jump even further away, as far as one third of an astronomical unit. That is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun in this Sol 13 solar system. And from that point of exit on, and until it arrives safely into planetary orbit, the ship must coast at slow, under light speed using traditional engine power only. An interesting fact is that when a ship exists its jump it produces a disturbance in the field in the space around that area, and that produces a bust of gamma rays. The burst is directly proportional to the size and mass of the starship. This gamma ray burst is an easily detectable telltale of a ship exiting hyperspace and it is detectable from Earth with present day technology. This disturbance in the field of space where the ship exited its jump will remain there as a wake remains after a sea ship passes by in the water. After all, space is water in a high vibratory state as I explained in my previous video. This disturbance also has a specific frequency and this frequency matches the one of the place of departure. This same way, when a ship jumps into hyperspace it will leave in the place of departure another temporary disturbance in space that also matches the intended destination. So for a few seconds, another ship with well-tuned high power sensors can know where the other ship has gone, and its navigation computer can effectively plot to follow it. Another basic navigation principle is the so-called space skipping, as translated into English, and it refers to when a starship does not jump directly to its destination, it exits its jump in deep space for an instant before jumping again into hyperspace with a course correction. This is done mainly to remove the telltale frequency wake a ship leaves behind where it initially jumped from, mainly to cover its tracks, and it is mostly used as a combat maneuver. The last basic description for today will be the engine drive system. The navigation computer of a starship will take the correct frequency of the destination from its frequency map and then it will send the signal to the engine's primary control computer that in turn will instruct electromagnetic, or sometimes hydraulic, servos to move the physical relationship between the counter-rotating turbines inside each engine. 
The relationship between the moving drums determines the output frequency of the electromagnetic plasma. And this frequency when immersing the ship in a toroid will match the existential frequency of the place of destination. This high-energy toroid will be formed when electromagnetic plasma is expelled from the engine or engines, as the plasma holds an electric polarity it will tend to go to the opposite, that is placed at the front of the ship, this device is called a magnetic collector, from where the ship's hull itself and massive superconductor cables will carry the high-energy electric current derived from the plasma through the ship and will direct the current into the flow modulator device and then finally back into the engine or engines to be recycled into more electromagnetic plasma and with this forming a full immersion toroid surrounding the ship. This full immersion electromagnetic toroid is also what generates a ship's protective shield. Ship engines of this kind are made of several layers of rotating drums, from 2 to 9 usually and depending on the type, one inside the other, much like an onion. Each layer will rotate in the opposite direction to each other, one clockwise, and the other counterclockwise while immersed in a special high-temperature superconductor liquid which primary component is enriched mercury. This special liquid also functions as internal lubrication for the entire engine assembly. A ship, especially large ones also carry a large number of gravity-generating or gravity-modulating secondary engines. Small ships may have only one of these devices, although three is the most usual lower number. Larger ships may have thousands of them. They are metallic blue spherical objects usually 3 meters in diameter although the size varies depending on the ship. These devices are made of several counter-rotating internal spheres, like an onion, also full of the same special liquid engine's use and use the very same physical principle. These devices distort and modulate the gravity field around them, cancelling or augmenting it whenever the computer instructs them to do so. Smaller ships may use these devices as their primary means of propulsion, and larger ships use them to maneuver while at speed or to counteract gravity when they approach their docking area on the surface of a planet. We will go a lot more into detail as we move on. These are just the basic concepts. Thank you all for being here with me. All my love and a huge hug. See you soon. Marie Soiru